across the known world, there is an insidious substance which is destroying the minds of today's teens. This substance, often called booze, hooch, or fire water, is everywhere. At school, in the playground, and yes, even in the home. Bobby. Bobby is going to high school for the first time. He's a little nervous. But because he has the support of his parents, his friends, Bobby knows he'll be fine. Bobby also knows there will be many new challenges in high school. Unfortunately, the one Bobby is least prepared for is alcohol. That's right, alcohol. The temptation is everywhere. There is no doubt that alcohol is ruining the lives of today's youth. It's poisoning their minds and their precious bodily fluids. And it must be stopped now. In high school, there will be pressures to drink alcohol. Hey, Bobby, you're really cute. You want to try some alcohol? I don't know. I heard that alcohol is bad for you. Come on, Bobby. All the cool kids are doing it. Maybe I should ask my parents. Okay. Alcohol can even be found at home. Even one sip of alcohol can cause a loss of bodily function and a lack of good judgment. It can even cause death. So if you're thinking of trying alcohol, think again. What happened to Bobby could happen to you. It could be anywhere. It could be their college town. It could be their hometown. Slip off to a party one night. Alcohol becomes readily accessible to them. They start drinking, you have peer pressure. You're drunk, but you want to be drunker, and somebody dares you. Next thing you know, they've had way too much, and they're not their normal selves. I wasn't thinking smart. I wasn't thinking about what the consequences could be. Alcohol is a toxin. It's a poison. There's no way around it. Kids are not invincible. No one is invincible. Binge drinking can give you a buzz on its way to killing you. We have been to, to deaths that were strictly alcohol poisoned. They couldn't move him. And they weren't sure he was breathing. That's when the 911 call was made. It happens every year to somebody that thought it wouldn't happen to them. I just miss him a lot. When you drink alcohol, there's a wide range of effects that it can produce depending upon how much you drink. And everybody understands you can have a few drinks and maybe not feel much different and you can be drunk. The term binge drinking is defined by four or five drinks in a two hour period. We know that when people cross four or five drinks, they enter a zone where their risk of consequences goes up. Depending upon your height and weight, you could be at a really risky level. The teen brain is changing tremendously. And because the brain is so moldable during the teenage years and so much change is occurring, it, it renders the brain of a teenager incredibly vulnerable, incredibly sensitive to the effects of stuff that blocks brain development. And almost no drug blocks brain development better than alcohol. It just stops it in its tracks. Here's what happens to the brain when alcohol is consumed in a binge drinking episode. Imagine a typical 21-year-old male weighing 160 pounds drinking one and a half ounce shots of 80 proof alcohol like tequila or rum or gin once every 10 minutes. The first two shots bring his blood alcohol concentration to about 0.05%, approaching the legal limit for intoxication, which is 0.08%. The alcohol in his body is affecting multiple brain chemical systems at this point. His cerebral cortex, including the frontal lobes and the cerebellum are impacted. He probably feels a sense of euphoria produced by increased activity of dopamine in the brain's reward system. He might start to feel off balance and his speech might even sound a little slurred at this level. 
By the third or fourth drink, the adverse effects on the cerebral cortex and cerebellum escalate with a significant increase in the activity of a brain chemical called gamma amino acid, or GABA. GABA begins acting on these parts of the brain and compromises balance, coordination, concentration, and visual tracking, the ability of the eyes to follow a moving target. All of these things make it dangerous to drive and increase the odds of injuries and other consequences. By five or six drinks, the cortex, the cerebellum, the limbic system, and lots of subcortical regions are now all adversely impacted. At this level of intoxication, blackouts can occur, probably because the hippocampus, the memory creation center of the brain, isn't functioning properly. As our subject continues drinking, the brain suffers even more. At some point, areas in the brainstem are suppressed, causing extreme sedation, loss of temperature regulation, and potentially loss of reflex actions like gagging. Breathing and heart rate become slower, the drinker may lose consciousness, and even go into a coma as the entire brain begins to shut down. The risk of death from alcohol poisoning is now very real, as is the risk of permanent brain damage. I'd be very curious to know about your experiences. At the high school level, do you feel pressure to drink? Well, sometimes, yes. It depends who you're hanging around with. And especially for the football players' parties, when the football <laughs> season starts, you get a lot of pressure because everybody's doing it and you feel like you have to do it. It definitely makes it harder to, to try not to drink. Peer pressure is unbelievable. This is a drug that does so much damage to your brain, to your body, to society. It's ironic to me that this is a drug that is that dangerous and can kill you, uh, but yet the kids that don't drink are made to feel like there's something wrong with them. It's hard to fit in with a larger group. It couldn't have surprised me more. I, no one knew Gordy as well as me. And he, I never thought, would let this kind of thing happen. He was always my role model for pretty much everything, how to stay optimistic, he was always happy, how to play sports, how to make friends. We're just best friends. We like doing everything together. He loved all kinds of performing arts, music, but first and foremost, he was an athlete. He really thought he could handle pretty much any situation that he would be put in. He was probably the last person that any of his friends would have felt would have succumbed to peer pressure. Gordy always uh, danced to his own drum, would never follow the crowd. Gordy left for college, and he was very excited to go, but he was a little, I guess, Hesitant because he was going from a very tiny, small high school to a really big university. He had been accepted to the fraternity he wanted to join. And that same day, they were told that they were going to be taking a trip to meet some brothers to learn more about the tradition of the fraternity. They were blindfolded, driven up to a hill, and when the blindfold was taken off, Gordy saw that there wasn't any uh, brotherhood education going on. There was a bonfire and the brothers had 10 gallons of alcohol that they challenged the pledges to drink before they were going down to the fraternity party that was planned. I gather there was a lot of drinking straight out of the bottle, a lot of guzzling alcohol in a very short amount of time. He really was big and thought that he could probably handle as much or more than any of the other pledges. There was probably a feeling that the more you could have, the cooler guy you were. Gordy did his share, maybe more than his share, in the challenge of drinking alcohol. Certainly had a very high blood alcohol level. It was the equivalent of him having had approximately 17 shots of hard alcohol in 30 minutes. It was clear when he got back to the fraternity house that he needed medical help. Gordy was really visibly intoxicated and not in very good shape. And so he was put on a couch just to kind of lie down. They felt he was in enough trauma that they wanted some brothers to monitor his particular health. And they asked some of the boys to take his pulse to make sure he was still alive. When the party was finally wrapping up, they checked on Gordy and they basically made the decision that he was fine and that he would sleep it off. Um, and they went to bed. 
When you drink alcohol, it takes anywhere from a half an hour to an hour or so for the alcohol to be absorbed completely and for the level of alcohol in your blood to reach its peak. Most of the alcohol you drink gets absorbed from the intestine. If you drink a lot quickly, it sits there in your stomach. You still have alcohol waiting to be absorbed. If you're on the verge of passing out and you still have a belly full of alcohol, then the odds are pretty good that you could find yourself in serious trouble. Because while you're passed out, that alcohol is still being absorbed. And as it's being absorbed, it's still suppressing your brain function. At about 11 in the morning, I got a phone call from someone in Dallas saying that the Dallas police were looking for me. I called a friend of mine and they basically said that the police had been at their house and that they had some very bad news for me. It's just the biggest shock to hear that like your best friend in the entire world is gone. You just can't even imagine what it would be like and I still even today it's been almost two years I still like can't believe it. They said Gordy had died that morning. He succumbed to peer pressure, thinking that the boys in his fraternity would never do anything to harm him. It's just amazing that they could see my brother in such trouble and not do anything. It's just so frustrating to know that someone could have done something and they didn't. When you get a call that it's over, it's unbelievable that he was found dead. I was like, you got to be kidding. I just talked to him. I just talked to him the evening before. It doesn't matter how big you are. There's some level of alcohol that will kill you. And it's not going to be too much more than the amount of alcohol that gets you drunk. Like, I go to parties and stuff also, but I don't <clears throat> drink as much. And I've noticed that some people, they just get to this point where they just pass out and stuff. And I don't know. How do you deal with people when they're like that and make sure that they're safe? What I say that people should do is you call for help. Nobody would regret calling for help when somebody truly needs it and they survive because they got medical attention. You would regret, however, hoping the person's going to be okay and then they die. So when in doubt, call for help. It just That's how you avoid these tragedies. Most students come down for spring break with the intention of having a good time. They don't come down to get in trouble. They don't come down to get themselves hurt. What happens is, is you get students coming down here. Some of them is the first time away from home. Sometimes it's the, it's the first time for them to be without parental supervision, someone watching over them. You get down here and there are no parents. And there's no teachers. And all of a sudden other people are doing this kind of thing and, and drinking very excessively and maybe your peers are pushing you, hey, you know, let's see if you can do five shots, you know, let's see if you can funnel this beer. And it's very easy to get caught up in that. One thing leads to another. Some begin drinking, some wind up hurting themselves, some wind up in predicaments they don't really want to be in. Nobody thinks, I'm going to die. You particularly don't think, I'm going to die as a teenager. They don't come here thinking, you know, I'm going to do something really stupid on spring break and hurt or kill myself or somebody else. Come here. I'm here, Catherine. Come here. Yes, you. Do you have your identification with you? No, sir, I do not. How old are you? 21. We don't allow funneling on Bay County beaches, okay? Binge drinking is synonymous with spring break. It's constant drinking. They'll use beer bongs. They'll shoot beers. They'll do keg stands. The only problem is, is they don't believe they can get hurt, and that's where they make their fatal mistake. <laughs> Things that get people hurt or can kill people are most always attributed here during spring break to alcohol. It's those horrible accidents that happen because lack of judgment. It's somebody that, that's climbing from one story to another at a hotel. Just about every balcony fall we've had in Panama City Beach during spring break involved alcohol. 
I can't think of one in nine years that did not involve alcohol. Most all of them died. They get out in the road, a driver comes by that's impaired, that strikes them, and every year we have you know, several cases of people that's hit on the side of the road uh, by a vehicle. This stuff can kill you because you're drinking, you're not paying attention to what's going on around you, and then they fall, they break bones, they get head injuries. We've seen them with very high blood alcohol levels, uh, unconscious. We've had people fall off the roof of cars. We've had people get their legs smashed, dangling them out the back of a car. Another person who's impaired, not see them, smack into the back of them. There's nothing, nothing more troubling than have to sit and watch a mom or a dad cry because something's happened to their young daughter or their young son. That's what the students need to think about. They're not only affecting themselves, but they're affecting their parents, they're affecting the rest of their family, they're affecting their friends, all because they decided they wanted to partake in the festivities and drink as much alcohol as they could drink. One of the real tragedies of underage drinking is the extent of sexual assault that occurs. We see it constantly every spring break. Women or men get themselves into situations that they normally wouldn't get themselves into. Females in particular will wake up not sure of what happened the night before and realize that some sort of sexual encounter has occurred. They don't remember giving consent and that is a frightening thing. It happens because if you drink a lot quickly, the area of the brain that makes new memories, the hippocampus, is shut off. So you're walking around doing stuff and you're not making memories for it. And during that time, if sex happens to occur, whether it's consensual or forced, there won't be a memory formed. Young women can be out drinking. Some guy comes along, says he'll take them home. They pass out in the car from the alcohol, and then next thing they know, they're being raped. They're an easy target. My name is Sarah Lynn. I was the new kid in school. I had moved from a small town to Ithaca, New York. I was in my senior year of high school, and my good friend and I were going to a dance convention about three hours from our house in Buffalo, New York. We started talking with the, the roadies, basically, the people who came in and set up the dance floor, set up all of the music equipment. They were probably in their late 20s. I would guess that they were probably 10 years older than we were at the time. And it happened to be Halloween. So that evening, my friend and I came as Tom and Jerry and dressed up as a cat and a mouse. The crew knocked on our door. And there were three guys who said, would you guys like to go out for a couple drinks? And I knew it was something that my parents would not be okay with. But we decided to do it anyway, since my parents had already gone to bed, so we knew that we could probably get away with it. Part of me was hoping that we wouldn't actually get into the bar, in part because I knew what we were doing was wrong and I was with strange people I didn't know. On the other hand, I didn't want to be seen as a party pooper or a prude, and so I went along with it. We got into the bar with no problem. Nobody was checking IDs at the door. We just walked in. I remember distinctly thinking, well, I'm here already, so I might as well drink, because what am I going to do if I just sit here? I mean, everybody else around me was drunk. I had no way to get home. I had no way to get back to the hotel. So I was just, I figured, well, I might as well have a few drinks. We probably had about, I would say, six or seven drinks. We were drinking hard alcohol. I definitely think I was binge drinking that night. I know I was. I mean, it was part of the whole wanting to rebel and go out and do something that I could go back and tell my friends about, and we were definitely binge drinking that night. We decided to go back to the hotel, and of course they were our ride there, so we had to ride back with them. I really just wanted to go back to our room and call it a night, but I think the men that we were with expected something else to come out of the night. I remember for a while, Nia and I were trying to sort of politely get them to leave the room, but they just really didn't seem to pick up on any of the hints. Nia had somehow gone off with the, another guy, so I was in the room by myself at that point. When he first pushed me onto the bed, I felt 
a little scared, but I remember thinking, he can't be serious. Like, he's gotta be joking around, this can't be real. He literally had me by each wrist. His body weight was on top of me, and he basically was forcing himself on me. He kept saying, come on, come on, and trying to coax me into something, and I was all of a sudden in panic mode. I just remember thinking, so this is everything that we heard about in school where they tell us to be careful, and this is what my parents meant when they said, be careful not to put yourself in a bad situation with a strange man. I started getting a little bit angry and frustrated with him and tried to pull my wrist away, and then he was getting angry at me. I, I said no a couple times, and he started getting more angry and then calling me names. He got so frustrated with me that he eventually just got up and said, you're a prude, and left. You just don't think that when you're drinking that something like that could happen. And you, you don't have the foresight to think ahead and realize that maybe you're putting yourself in a dangerous situation. When you're drinking that much, you have less inhibitions, you have less caution. You're not thinking ahead to what that the consequences might be. It was sort of like this realization that you didn't want to come to and you never thought you would, but it was that I got myself into this situation and I could have stopped it, but I hadn't, I didn't, and I ended up not thinking that I deserved it by any means, but thinking this is what happens when you're not being smart. And I remember thinking I would never let it get to that point again. Being a female, there are just all these things that can go wrong that are unique to being a female. I've been told that since I'm so thin, I could quite possibly pass out much quicker than someone who was bigger than me. The smaller you are, the less body you have for the alcohol to go into. And so you could look at it a little bit like this. If you took a huge glass of Coke and put a shot of rum in it, the alcohol's gonna be less concentrated than if you took a little glass of Coke and put a shot in it. Little people are like the little glass of Coke. You add a shot, and there's just way more alcohol floating around in their body relative to the, their body size. Females are more likely to black out. Females are more likely to uh, suffer even more mild memory impairments. You reach higher blood alcohol concentrations, and you're already at greater risk of being assaulted. So the risks are different. You know, I think a little bit of effort, people could find other things to do. My name is Elaine Leidick. I'm 17 years old. My name is Kevin Nichols, I'm 17 years old. This week is our spring break. We came up to New York to help the homeless with a group called YSOP. Every day we go to one or two different um, soup kitchens or homeless shelters or food banks to help serve the poor and the homeless. You guys want dressing on your salads? Yeah. You want dressing on yeah. your salads? We're all really good friends, so we have a really good time. We all just love helping people. We also get to go out sightseeing the urban adventure of going into the city and experiencing that. It is vacation for me. I am out of my hometown. I'd rather be sober and I can have fun being sober, so what's the point in getting drunk? There's not really that much pressure because if you talk to your friends about it, they know where you stand and they won't really push you into anything you don't want to do. And it's safer too, not drinking. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy helping people and seeing just a different perspective on life that I wouldn't see otherwise. You leave with new friendships, you leave with a new sense of self-worth. So I think as we've been discussing today, we now know that the brain is developing between the ages of 10 and 20 plus. We know that when Alcohol is poured onto changing brains. It disrupts how those brains work and can, can maim them. We also know that you only have to drink one time to die. It's not like you have to do damage to your liver or your brain to do it. It is not a safe drug. One thing that really struck me was the fact that it's not just the law says don't do it, so don't do it. You gave us real reasons not to want to drink. I don't want to drink because I have a future and I have goals for my life and if I get drunk and something happens to my brain, I'm not going to be able to accomplish that and I could possibly affect someone else's life.